to begin um, by swearing in the um, witnesses for Southwest Vermont. Um, Kim, if you could swear them in, if all the witnesses could raise their hand. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. And would you please state your name? Okay. I'll start at um, Thomas D. Thank you. Stephen Majetic. And Trey Dobson. Great. Thank you. And Tom, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, um, I have one question before Tom starts. So Abigail, I just click share and then hit the PowerPoint. That's correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, just, Kevin, you, you, you you're trusting me. Steve with controlling this, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> I, 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 you froze me, Kevin, so I'm not sure if you told me to do anything, so. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, th thank you all. And again, we'll, we will we'll share this presentation um, between myself and Steve Majedic, our Chief Financial Officer, and, and Dr. Trey Dobson, our Chief Medical Officer. And again, thank you all. And Steve's going to be at the control panel here advancing. So thank you, Steve. Hey, Steve, can you just go back a second to the opening? Yeah, I just want to show that this is a photo from uh, May 22nd. That's the Vermont Air National Guard doing their flyover in Vermont that day, which is, which is pretty cool. And we had we our our hospital responders and team appreciate that. So next slide. This, uh, folks, is just a, a, a quick uh, visual of the SV, and this is SVHC, which is healthcare health system. That's our parents, of which you know the majority is uh, SVMC. About eighty percent of our health system is made up of the medical center. And we, you know, we have a presence in a tri-state region, and we serve about seventy thousand people. Um, so it's still, you know, it's relatively sparse. Um, it's a broad region, um, and we have certainly physical barriers. We have two major mountains that we deal with, um, and um, we're hoping to see some additional population growth with what's been going on down in New York City and the other New England states. Next slide. And this is just a profile, a snapshot of SVMC. Um, again, we're, we're, we had our 100th anniversary a couple of years ago. As I mentioned, we're serving, we have a presence in three states, Vermont, New York, and, and, and Massachusetts. Um, we, have, um, we are the largest employer in the uh, southwestern Vermont region, employing a, a little over 1,400 people. And... Um, you know, one of the things about our medical staff, I'll just give a, a shout out, is that it's a great medical staff and, and we're 100 percent board certified um, hospital uh, medical staff, which is you know, kind of unusual for a lot of community rural facilities. Uh, <clears throat> we have a number of awards. I won't go through them. There's one I'm going to highlight in a, in a little bit, which is the a new award we got this year from um, the Lone um, Hospital uh, Institute. I'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. Next slide, Steve. So this is just uh, a snapshot of our Vision 2020, which is our strategic roadmap. And I think I've mentioned this to you in the past, that it's really based on, on three strategic initiatives. First one being building uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, our, our, our major partner is Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, and we've been we've been affiliated with Dartmouth now for seven years, so it's been a it's been a long journey with Dartmouth. We are, a, you know, this past twelve months has been disappointing because, um, you know, with the impact of COVID, as well as Dartmouth going through a full asset merger with um, Granite Health in New Hampshire, we have not been able to move our our corporate um, linkage closer together. Um, but we, we, we're still confident that that will happen. Hopefully that will be consummated in 2021. But the partnership strategy is probably our, our most critical initiative. Uh, we are trying to transform our health system and, and moving away f into much more of an ambulatory care model and close to 80% of our revenue is, is, is ambulatory at this point in time. And of course, we need to be sustainable. We need to be able to provide a high value care 
at a, an affordable co uh, cost. And that's something that's really something that we all focus on very much here at, at our health system. Thanks, one, Steve. So what I'm, I'm going to actually end on this slide here, and, I, and uh, <clears throat> at least my piece of it. And this is a one pager. And our board asked us to put our, our strategic plan together on one page. And this is a, is a graphic that kind of explains really our key initiatives and where we're going. And at the top of the page, you see the, the icon of um, you know, shaking hands. And that's representing the, the affiliation and partnerships that we're pursuing. As I said earlier, Dartmouth is our major partner and we fully expect to be part of a member of their system. They will become our new parent corporation uh, we're looking to do a combination agreement that will really um, integrate our, our systems together. But, part, but Dartmouth is not the only partner we're pursuing. We're, we're, we, we fully understand that they are, you know, they are uh, you know, certainly a national class organization, but there's things that they can't provide for us. So we are part of our strategy is we are reaching out to other, other institutions and community organizations to partner with. And, and for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one would be some of the um, hospitals in the Albany region, primarily St. Peter's. We're talking to them not to do an affiliation or, a part, or, or any type of corporate linkage, but we're, we're working with them to um, help local, help some of their providers come to Vermont and meet some of our needs. And we're, an example of this would be in, for GI services. We're in the midst of developing a contract with them to help for GI services that have been, we've had shortages of GI physicians. And um, as one example, and we're also looking at partners in the area of long-term care uh, and, and key specialty services and, and behavioral health. So uh, we understand we can't do everything ourselves. We need other organizations. So this is a, it's a major relationship building strategy that we're creating. And then uh, the, the columns underneath the, the partnership really is our key um, operational and clinical initiatives. Under advancing clinical services, um, you know, we understand that we're primarily a secondary and, and primary care hospital. Uh, we're not a tertiary care center, uh, but we know we need to enhance those those primary and secondary services in order to help um, help to provide the needs of our community and, and allow more of our patients to stay local and not have to out migrate down to um, down to um, Boston or, or over to Albany or in some cases uh, make a two hour trip up to Lebanon. So we're trying to enhance those services. We are looking to not become a, a psychiatric hospital, but we are looking to enhance our behavioral health and substance abuse services, that's a major initiative that uh, we put in our plan and we're working with different providers, especially our, our local designated agency to be our partner in that. And um, the area that are one of our major changes is moving towards our long-term care strategy. We are bringing a partner in who has much more experience and capital in the long-term care area to help uh, partner with our nursing home. And that's an application that will be submitted to, the, um, to, to Vermont uh, in a very near future. From our operations standpoint, um, we, are, we are continuing to integrate and strengthen our ties with the Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, Management Services Organization. Um, they are running, Dartmouth now is running our, our physician group practice. Um, Dr. Dobson is our medical director there. He's a Dartmouth employee. Uh, we have about 125 providers in that group, and that's a, that's a major growing segment of our operations. Um, we understand that sustainability is going to be critical, and we need to have strong operations to do that. And we think we can attain economies of scale by working with organizations such as, as um, Dartmouth to share our overhead costs in many areas such as um, IT. Next column, the gray column, is our is our uh, improving our infrastructure. We are we're not the oldest hospital in Vermont, but we have the oldest physical plant. We have not made major enhancements. Uh, we do have a major CON that has been submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board to modernize our emergency room, um, and but we have a series of CONs that we'll be submitting over the next few years to to modernize our campus. 
And I, I would say that is our major Achilles heel in terms of our operations is, a, is an outdated um, infrastructure. But we're also looking to expand our workforce. Uh, we're developing relationships. We're developing training programs. We have a major relationship with Castleton University. Uh, their School of Nursing now is down in Bennington. Uh, we're partnering with them, and we are looking to aggressively grow our nursing workforce um, as both the need to, to meet the needs of the, of the health system, but also to create opportunities for employment in our region. And uh, we're, we've come up with a system where if a person would goes to Castleton and gets their four-year degree and, and comes and works with us for up to six years, we'll pay 100% of their college cost. So, uh, and we're getting good success with that. And of course, our, our, we have a huge infrastructure need for IT. As we move into the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system, we'll, we'll migrate to the Epic, their Epic platform. Uh, our expectation and desire is that they'll help us underwrite that. And that's a, that will be a major change for us over the next few years. Our, our current platform is Meditech and it's, it's, it's rather old. And, and we're moving our next column in the, in the gold, we're moving into primary prevention and, and community development. And that's a, that is a, a major initiative. We know in order for us to enhance the health status of our community, we have to move beyond the traditional role of just providing health care and, and working on other, you know, other social determinants of health. We're actively involved in housing. Um, we're doing many things there in terms of helping to redevelop Bennington. We're working with food insecurity. We were fortunate to be able to work with Bennington College and get a million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation to work on food insecurity. And that's a, that's a big project moving forward. Um, again, we're working, working on the educational and job sector and, and we're doing major community development. The, the downtown Putnam project, the first phase is, is about to be completed. The, the, the total project is um, about $58 million. The first phase is, is 28 million. And we hope to be done with that first phase by January and then start to do the second phase. And this all evolves towards the far right-hand column towards our, our population health and value-based care strategy. We know that our future is not fee-for-service. It's, it's much more based on, that of, um, of, on the value of care that we provide on outcomes-based management. Um, one thing I'm, I'm, you know, we're proud of is that the Lone uh, Hospital um, Institute just named us as one of the top hospitals in the country for, for value of care being rendered. And they, and they study um, um, the, co um, the cost of care, outcomes, utilization, um, and also investment in community health. And our, and our health system, our hospital scored very, very high, one of the highest in the country. So I think that's just an indicator of, of how serious we're taking the, the initiative to move away from the volume-based model and move towards an outcome-based model. And it's something that um, we think that journey, we're, we're early on in the journey, but it's one which we will continue to, to aggressively focus on. We understand we need to drive down the cost of care, and we think focusing on value will be a way for us to do that. Um, <clears throat> The past year has been something that we've been consumed by COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, as every hospital has. And, and I'm going to ask Trey now to give a, a, an overview on our initiatives and what we've been doing there. And I want to also do a, a shout out to Tr Dr. Dobson for a remarkable job he's done in terms of leading us to this very challenging time. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, can you all just real quick uh, let me know that you can hear me okay? We can. Great, super. Okay. Okay. So I'll, um, I'll just start off by saying, you know, we went right into a hospital incident command structure uh, like all organizations in the state. Um, what you're looking at there is just about half of the committees that we formed. But we, we really quickly realized um, that our staff was, was paralyzed by anxiety and fear, and you remember those those days, uh, late February, um, early March, um, and and when we when we spoke with them, we could see what they were concerned about. They were concerned about were they going to have to let patients uh, suffer on on gurneys in the hallway? Were they going to have to treat patients without the proper uh, a personal protective equipment? Were they going to spread the disease to the family? 
Um, that fear and anxiety really uh, was going to inhibit our ability to respond to this. Uh, we saw that right away. So we established five principles, and, um, and I'm actually going to go through them real quickly. Um, the, the, the principles were the first, and this was our guiding principle, is that our priority is the safety of our staff. Because without staff safety, we can't take care of patients. And we said that, and we say that over and over, and everything we do is governed by that statement. And another way to look at it, and you may have heard this, this phrase before, but during a pandemic, there, there is no emergency. And what I mean by that is there is not a staff member who is going to be asked nor feel compelled to go take care of a patient unless they have on all of the PPE. Um, they're not going to be doing partial and taking care of patients. So someone is having an emergency, whether that's a cardiac arrest, whether that's respiratory distress, uh, whether that's simply having a fever, staff will not go into that room and will not be compelled to do so until they have all of the PPE on. That actually gave a lot of relief uh, to our nursing staff, our hospitalists, our emergency physicians, all of those on the front line. And then that allowed us uh, to con continue on. Um, the rest of those principles were we were going to empower the leaders of these committees from the uh, slide before. We weren't going to just have them be directed to. Um, so we appointed people and they could make decisions and move. We knew that was important in this uh, pandemic and an emergency. We also said two things. We're going to have a supportive culture and we're not going to be hampered by uh, resistance and negativism. And we still say these, these principles uh, daily in our incident command, and, and it's given the staff the confidence uh, that they need, and it's helped us move forward. So next slide, if you don't mind, Steve. So that really allowed us to move into these volume uh, surge preparations that you know every organization moved into, but I, I feel like we were able to move into it with a lot of unity, a lot of support um, from staff uh, across all disciplines, um, now that their anxiety had been lessened, now that they knew that their safety was the priority, it allowed us to identify and credential providers uh, who might have been in the outpatient setting before to be ready for the inpatient, uh, to cross-train our staff, um, to secure additional beds, and then to implement drive-through uh, COVID testing, which we were, you know, fortunately one of the first places to do so, uh, which, was, which was a testament really to the staff and their belief uh, and what we were doing, plus the ability for them to be empowered. Um, interestingly, it's not that interesting of a story, but it was for me. We started talking about it on a Friday night and actually implemented the drive-through testing by Saturday evening. Uh, and normally not much gets done on the weekend. Uh, so I thought that was incredible. Uh, next slide, please. Then we, we knew that we would have to be innovative because securing PPE was going to be difficult. Uh, like everyone in early March, we started reading the reports, we started checking with our suppliers, and our biggest concern was not enough respirators. And everyone, I believe, knows uh, now that everyone's been educated through the media that there's really two types of respirators. There's disposable rep respirators, which are known as the N95s typically, and then there's the reusable respirators. So we quickly identified about 40 reusable respirators before uh, and secured those before um, all suppliers had exhausted um, their, their supplies of the respirator. And that wasn't enough for us, not near enough. We were very nervous. Uh, everyone in the state was very nervous. Everyone around the country was very nervous. Uh, so we decided to be innovative. We continued um, with our conventional suppliers, but then we, we got innovative. We worked throughout the weekends and overnights, and we actually reached out to manufacturing groups locally uh, and working with Mac Molding in Arlington, we bought and secured these masks that you can see there. Those are actually snorkel masks. Um, they're used in snorkeling. We, we bought 300 of them very easily. And then Mac Molding took the snorkel off and repurposed and retrofitted HEPA filters. So um, those, those individuals you see right there, everyone got their own mask, plus we have additional ones. And you know, they last um, a very long time, they're reusable, so people just keep them in their locker. And we sort of pushed the respirator concern out of the equation very early. And again, 
that gave our staff the confidence and gave us a, a little bit of breathing room, no pun intended. All right, next slide. We also knew about six weeks later when it became apparent the surge was either over or, or not coming in a, in a big peak, but rather more of a plateau, uh, that our non-COVID patients in the community and around the nation, of course, were experiencing harm uh, because they were not able to see their doctor and, and undergo uh, usual health maintenance proce uh, procedures, whether that's uh, medication adjustments, um, whether it's uh, procedures such as colonoscopies and screening things, eventually those things catch up. And then the national data started showing us increased uh, rates of death from uh, cardiovascular disease and other diseases. So uh, we decided that we needed to rapidly recover volume to decrease the morbidity and mortality in the community and, and fulfill our mission uh, with a main focus on safety. And so that's the plan that we involved everyone uh, in incident command and staff to move forward with and develop. Similarly to when we were preparing for surge, there was concern, there was anxiety about how are we gonna do this in a safe way? And what we did is we empowered people all the way down uh, at the ground level of those taking care of patients to make the decisions that safety is first, uh, no matter what. Next slide. Some of the things we decided to do, rather than gradually opening one or two departments and seeing how they go, we actually opened all sites at once, thinking that's the best way for our staff to be engaged and learn uh, the safety uh, requirements and the efficiency requirements. And it actually worked out really well, with the exception of dentistry, which was not allowed to reopen. We opened every site. Uh, we limited the volume through there, but we opened every site. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, to be able to follow all of the CDC recommendations and guidelines and the state. Um, most of that is a testament to our staff. Some of it is just circumstantial in the way the organization is laid out. And then we did the things that you know about that, you know, hopefully all uh, medical centers were able to do. The screening, the distancing, um, the novel ideas on, on how to expand waiting rooms and, and use other approaches for patients. Uh, masks uh, for everyone and limiting the number of visitors. Next slide, please. And then once May kind of got through, we uh, could see our volume starting to pick back up. We could see the morbidity decreasing. We could see the patients, uh, their fear of coming into the system uh, had dropped significantly with our staff's uh, focus on safety and, and, and also our staff's lack of anxiety and fear here locally. So then we decided to focus on three things from this operational recovery. We, we knew we needed to innovate. We knew that we couldn't be delivering healthcare in the same ways. And we knew we needed to do it in a way that patients could afford. Um, we knew that we needed to become more efficient. And then something that we didn't predict, but we quickly realized is that we had to become a resource to organizations locally and regionally um, as they started entering the phase of restarting their own businesses and school systems and organizations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, next slide. So for innovation, um, we of course did telemedicine, the second bullet there uh, that was very successful in our entire state. Um, of course, in communication with, with multiple hospital systems and, and medical staffs around the state to make sure that worked out for everyone. Uh, and that has been a very positive experience. Um, we then also very early recognized how are we going to keep people out of the waiting room but have them ready to come in and feel comfortable and safe. So we uh, quickly grabbed a, play, uh, a page out of the playbook for restaurants and other organizations and we developed a virtual waiting room. We made it very simple and very reliable. Our IS department did an awesome job and developed a homegrown system where uh, overnight really patients, uh, the the flow of patients changed where they pulled up into the parking lot. There were multiple signs up that t told them how to enter their number, uh, make a quick phone call, and they waited in their car, uh, and they still do this today. And then they are texted when they're, they're ready to come in, be screened, and see their provider. And the third bullet there was also quite unique. Um, we, we did this sort of in collaboration with Dartmouth Hitchcock, but we, we reached out uh, because we knew that our offices would be 
sort of overrun by patients worried that they have COVID every time they have a fever, and actually rightfully so, should be worried, and we should be screening them and testing them. But that doing that in 25 different locations, whether it's an orthopedic office or a primary care office, was not the best approach, that we need to standardize it and put it in one area where we have the right uh, equipment, resources, uh, the ability to monitor that equipment and resources for excess use, the staff trained to do this. And so we developed something that we called the Respiratory Evaluation Center, or the REC. Now, we developed it before all these extra diagnose or extra symptoms of COVID came out. So if I had to do it all over today, I probably wouldn't call it the Respiratory Evaluation Center. However, as the fall approaches and respiratory viruses, uh, other respiratory viruses come into play, maybe the name will be fitting. But this is a separate entity from our emergency department. It's, it's a separate entity, entrance um, and entity from our practices and our express care. It is uh, staffed by nurses and providers whose sole focus is on helping people that have symptoms that could be COVID related. And that's just been a big win for uh, individual patients, then for the community, and then for all the referring uh, offices who, who can now say, um, let's focus on other types of care. And if we get concerned about COVID, uh, let's send the patient there so they can get rapidly triaged and assessed. We anticipate that the volumes here will increase uh, even further in the fall and winter uh, as as, people, as other viruses start affecting people. Next slide. And you may uh, be aware that uh, we uh, unfortunately had a concern for an outbreak in Manchester. This was after the Winooski uh, outbreak. And just to remind you, there were about uh, 50 patients that tested positive at, a, at an urgent care center uh, not operated by SVMC in the Manchester area. Um, it caused a great concern because the information went out quickly uh, before the state could be involved and uh, businesses shut down, uh, camps were canceled, um, and it became very clear that the area was nearly panicked. And when I say that, uh, that is what happened. We, we hope that wouldn't happen again, uh, but it was the first outbreak in southern Vermont, or at least supposed outbreak. And so people responded uh, on social media. They responded um, uh, throughout the community in a shutdown manner. And so uh, we stepped in as quick as we could. Within 24 hours, our nursing staff and our providers had had changed their job description for the next few days uh, to moving up and into the Manchester area and assembling a pop-up clinic. Uh, on the same day that the Department of Health tested 400 uh, people, we did the same in a different location. And over five days, we tested nearly 1,500 um, uh, individuals in the community. So you, you may be aware that the result of that was about four or so um, positive cases uh, of those 60. So no one's really sure what happened. Uh, but nonetheless, the response helped the community restart I mean, some of the businesses restarted al almost immediately as soon as the test results started coming back. Uh, their anxiety decreased. We're in constant communication with them. And I think we're now very prepared in southern Vermont when clusters and outbreaks occur of how to systematically close down places that need to be closed down, uh, but not close in entire disconnected uh, organizations, which only leads to more panic and fear. Then we started working with um, many of these organizations, these schools, and let me just tell you what was such a surprise. Um, I, as I was reading information from the state, as soon as it would come out, um, and from the federal government, uh, focused on schools or focused on businesses, I, I've been struck with how well-written things have been, how the guidance has been concise, um, direct, and, and not trying to pigeonhole businesses and schools into following something that they wouldn't be capable of following, uh, but it, it left this one hole, and that is all of these organizations and, and schools were kind of like we were in healthcare back in early March. They were incredibly scared. They still are today as they restart. Uh, they're in incredibly anxious. Board. Uh, they don't have uh, a standard voice uh, that they can speak to and get their questions answered, and so we started doing 
explain that. And I'll tell you, it's pretty easy. Uh, the questions that they need answered, the, um, the statements they need to be made to them to, to get them to balance between this, this again, this paralysis of, of fear and anxiety uh, on one hand with other staff who are just complacent and in denial, getting that balance going. I'm losing you. Just do the I'm do sorry, Dr. Life. Dobson. Dr. Dobson, I, I lost yes. you. Um, you said other staff who were just complacent and in denial about getting that balance going, and then I lost what you said. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, what I was saying is what what we've what we realized, and, and again, this was a little bit of a yeah, surprise. Yeah. I'm, on. Um, and I'm talking. About, I'm sorry. Just a minute. Somebody's talking. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody thinks they're on mute, but they're not, and. Uh, Trey, I don't know. You were coming in so perfectly, and then all of a sudden, you, you, your uh, signal isn't as good. So, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I I apologize. Uh, can you hear me right this second, and I'll try to get through it. Yes. 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 All right. I'll speak quickly. Um, these organizations are everything from museums to schools to for-profit businesses to not-for-profit, and just being able to be. Uh, the, the agency that they can reach out to and help them with questions and help their staff and sometimes help their customers uh, has not typically been a role of a hospital system and we've embraced it. I'm very happy that, that we've been able to embrace this, that management is so um, supportive of it. It actually is not, doesn't take that much of an effort and it leads to these businesses. I'm gonna tell you, I've had some of these museums open up two, two weeks early Oh, you froze uh, again. Uh, you had some of the museums uh, open. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I you... about that my, my Wi-Fi must be dropping here. But that's actually my last slide. So hopefully the question and answers I'll be able to come through okay. So, Trey, maybe you could just finish that uh, one thought. You, I think you said that they were able to open two weeks early, but we couldn't really catch it. That's right. A, a couple places opened two weeks early, um, and some of the schools. What I was saying is the teachers are really finding the ability to uh, have presentations and to answer questions that they have. It really helps them understand what they need to be doing. Okay. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Tom. Um, now um, I'll take over. Um, um, we're going to go through the financial performance and uh, FY21 uh, budget request. Uh, this slide in front of you has um, the FY2020 uh, projection uh, compared to the budget. Um, I qualify the projection um, that it was prepared after the June financial statements. Um, I'm not proud to say, but every project, uh, projection I've done since uh, March has been, um, it changes, um, it seems like almost every day. Uh, and, um, you know, as we get ready to close our July financial statements, I do anticipate the projection for uh, uh, FY 2020 to be a little better uh, than is shown here. Also, don't we did, apologize for that, Steve. <laughs> well, it's good it's news. Yeah, it's good news. And also in this projection, uh, there's no uh, stabilization monies. Um, we just filed for the the, the state grant um, and we did not include that in the projection. So whatever we get there will also uh, assist us in our in our financial recovery. Uh, How much did you ask for, Steve? There is no place uh, in that in that ask in that grant. There's no place for an ask, uh, Kevin. Uh, what you do is you you submit it. You submit all of your uh, information, and AHS is going to calculate it uh, what based was upon the total of losses that you submitted. Well, the the revenue um, loss uh, for the uh, basically for the COVID period uh, ranges anywhere, depending on how you want to look at it, between twelve and fifteen million dollars. Um, so uh, all of that input was provided to AHS, and then they'll do a calculation um, uh, based upon their methodology. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, so most of the presentation, um, I will compare us uh, FY20 to F FY20 budget to the FY21 budget uh, and, and show the differences that way because uh, 2020 is, is a, let's just call it a strange year, uh, and that's being nice. Um, as you can see, our, our budget um, is a little bit better than a break-even budget. Um, our revenues um, will be uh, under last year's budget, and uh, our expenses uh, will be slightly higher than last year's budget. Um, and we'll go through all of that uh, in the uh, next few slides. Um, our historical operating performance, as you can see from 2015 to 2019, uh, have, uh, we've, we've almost every year except for a 19 uh, outperform our submitted budget. Um, we saw a decline in 19 and, and 19 we, uh, I'll talk a little later in the presentation, some of the um, items that uh, had us below budget uh, and mainly uh, the One Care uh, program as well as a decline in our volumes uh, that we had uh, uh, projected on. Our net patient service revenue request, um, like I said, is a $5.1 million, almost $5.2 million decrease. Um, the most significant assumption in this budget is that in our pre-12-month uh, pandemic, uh, uh, pre-pandemic 12-month uh, volume trends, we were trending 4% uh, below previous years and our 2020 budgeted levels. And roughly 4% has an impact of about $7 million. So um, when we were building our budget this year, uh, we were like, okay, what baseline should we do? And, you know, we're doing this in late uh, May into June and early July. And where were our volumes going to be? Um, and when the bulk of when we, the bulk of the assumptions were, were discussed it, uh, with our leadership team, um, we were seeing uh, the month of uh, the beginning of June, we were about 80, running at about 80%. And our, our idea was to get back to 100% by October 1st of our run rate, which was actually below what we had, had, had budgeted. So um, that is the foundation uh, for our volume assumptions in our budget, uh, to get back to the run rate of the previous 12 months in the pre-pandemic um, uh, period. And so as a result, um, our volumes uh, are lower in this year's budget than they were in previous years. Um, and um, we, the $5.2 million is made up of volume and service uh, declines. And uh, we are asking for a, a rate increase um, and uh, of about $1.87 million. Um, and that's made up of a charge increase that has an effective rate of about 3.46% or roughly $3 million. For the, all these slides, I rounded all of the numbers, so it may not exactly hit, but it's in the ballpark. Um, Medicare increases, we put about a 1% in, uh, looking at the proposed regs uh, for Medicare for next year. Um, it's about, it's a, but it's about 1.07 percent to be exact. Uh, we also applied that to the fixed payment model, the One Care Medicare, um, because um, we still haven't received guidance from One Care uh, due to, um, you know, continued negotiations with CMS and CMMI. Uh, we did put in um, a payer mix shift. Um, one of the concerns that we have uh, each year, and we've seen it, um, the pay and mix shift uh, more to Medicare, uh, away from commercial, that that had an effect of about negative $550,000. Um, office telehealth reduction. We are actively, uh, as Trey talked about um, uh, briefly, um, you know, as, as we have patients uh, that can use telehealth, we're using telehealth. And reimbursements, while we are getting paid from insurance companies and from Medicare and Medicaid, there is um, less reimbursement. So as we substitute visits uh, to telehealth, there's less cost. Now, some of those visits um, are, are, are great uh, over telehealth. Other visits aren't. So there's a balance that we have to do. And the, the medical group's uh, team uh, went through and the budget, uh, while we have visits, 
Uh, some are telehealth and some are in office, and the telehealth uh, will have a negative impact on on our um, uh, revenues, about $430,000. Uh, due to the lower payments. Um, and then we also increased our bad debt and charity care by $600,000 in total. Uh, so as a result, uh, what we get paid for uh, in this budget is only a really a rate increase of $1,870,000. Um, $1, um, the biggest chunk is the rate increase of 3.46. Uh, gross charges will be a 5% increase. We're only going to increase 69, approximately 69% of our charges. Uh, there'll be no cross the board increase on the physician office practice charges. Uh, when we look at that, and the reason we're doing that, most of it is on a fee schedule. Uh, most of the physician office uh, charges and our charges are still above what we get paid. And we've been we've been closing that gap, but we still got a ways to go. So that's why there's no increases on the physician office practice charges. Uh, drugs and med surge supplies, there'll be no cross the board increase on those charges because uh, that's on a cost a cost plus uh, methodology, uh, which is not changing. Uh, and the three million dollar increase in in charges is about one point seven nine percent of the total and. Uh, net patient service revenue. Um, so, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, um, you know, um, we can, the real effective rate is 3.46, but it's not a, it's not a big number on the total uh, net patient service revenue. Uh, I think I talked about the Medicare increase and the other items, but bad debt and charity care at the bottom, you'll see that our budget was 8.6 million. Uh, we're increasing it to 9.2. Um, when you look, when you put the charge increase into the bad debt formula, about half of that six hundred thousand dollars is due to the charge increase in the three million dollars, uh, and about uh, three hundred thousand dollars is a modest increase, uh, considering the risks that we uh, may have in this part of the state. Actually, it's part of the whole state and in the country, uh, due to the economic turndown due to the pandemic. Uh, but it's a risk for us. Uh, we recognize that risk and uh, we will monitor it closely. On the volume side, um, you know, we're budgeting 150 less uh, inpatient um, cases. And, um, you know, uh, inpatient volume has not come back to our budgeted levels. Uh, even as of this past week, uh, we are trailing on inpatient volume. Um, to, to our target, we were trailing uh, last year. Um, our emergency room has been uh, the, one of the services also trailing since the pandemic, but was also uh, down. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I'll go to the next slide that shows, um, I did two comparisons in, this, in these slides, uh, the inpatient volumes when I looked at actual five months, February 20 to February 19, we were, we were behind. Uh, as you can see, all the all the major categories, we were behind a year to year, five months actual. Uh, and then when we look at our budget, we were behind. So this year, um, you know, we thought long and hard. And uh, we, again, uh, our, our biggest assumption is volume will be uh, was built off of the uh, 12 month run rate uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, Included in our budget is um, we are going to participate in Medicare, Medicaid, and the Blue Cross Exchange. Uh, we also participate in some of the smaller programs. I didn't bother highlighting them; they're they're not material. Um, Medicare is about 24 million, Medicaid almost uh, 3.7.5 uh, million, and the Blue Cross Exchange, uh, which is now an upside-only model, uh, for 37 million. Uh, as of as of today, um, the corridors uh, and the and the risk uh, corridors still are not resolved. Um, and so uh, if those risk corridors are too large, uh, we reserve the right to change our um, mind, but we are committed to this, but we got to make sure that those risk corridors are uh, acceptable um, to to um, leadership and the board. <clears throat> Um, so just recapping, uh, revenues down, uh, rate increase of 3.46, volume, volume will be 
be at the pre-pandemic and uh, one half of 1% increase in bad debt and charity care. So that's um, the, the net patient service revenue um, portion of the presentation. Um, and as you can see, uh, I highlighted on this schedule just that our 19 audited was uh, 164 million. The budget uh, for uh, 2020 was 172, and we're coming in about 167 based upon those volumes, payer mix assumptions, bad debt assumptions, and rate increases. Uh, going back to our operating performance, I'll show you this slide before, but um, I'd like to just spend a little time on, on um, where we were before the pandemic. Um, in February of 2020, uh, we were five months into um, um, our fiscal year, and we saw ourselves with an operating margin uh, that was about 1.17. Um, and the leadership team was um, working on an action plan to bring that back to budget because our volumes and our revenues were, were trailing. Um, and we then prepared a, a, a plan that was going to um, add about $2 million to our operations, mainly in expense reductions. Um, we looked at a couple of services and we were gonna get up to about 2.3%. Um, uh, um, if, you know, uh, we probably would have been below our budget this year if everything uh, panned out. Um, uh, and we were, you know, targeting, let's call it two and a half percent. And then we were going to continue to work to improve services. As Tom mentioned, we've been reached, we, we've been talking to St. Peter's uh, to try to um, um, bring some of their physicians over to do services in our facility. So all of those things are being talked about. But we had an action plan getting, um, actually, we started to implement that would get us up to that 2.3% uh, uh, operating margin, which was significantly below our budget of 3.4 and below our previous five-year run rate. Um, but the pandemic then hit, and, and a lot of those plans had to be put on the shelf and are incorporated into the FY21 plan. Um, however, um, you know, we coming out of this plan and um, out of the pandemic, and um, we put a projection together that's only coming in at about a 0.9. Uh, probably we'll do better than that uh, with the stabilization, July being a little better, payer mix being a little better uh, than we, uh, but uh, we still have some issues we need to go over with our auditors on the accounting of some of the stimulus money and, and you know, will we have to pay any of it back? So we're going through that exercise right now and we'll incorporate them in our future projections. Um, so as you can see, uh, we were trailing behind what we um, were budgeting. Uh, we're gonna come in less um, than what we anticipated. Um, and um, so, um, you know, I just wanted to go over some of our uh, indicators. Uh, profitability, you know, we've been consistent. Um, you know, the biggest uh, item um, that I can t I can really look at when I look at 19 below the 2020, um, 18 results was uh, there was an impact. Uh, our volumes were down, but the impact of one care um, Vermont participation in FY19 and 20 um, pre-pandemic uh, had a negative uh, uh, contributing, was a negative contributing factor in our financial performance. However, um, as Tom mentioned, we're committed to, to this program, population health, or whatever we want to call it. Um, uh, we need to, we need as a as a community, as a state, uh, to curb the um, cost of health care. So uh, we're still committed, but it had a negative effect on us. And you know, I went back and I looked at several other um, presentations we did uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board on our budget. And one thing that um, we did early on before we got into One Care, the SVMC Transitional Care Program, uh, we documented that we reduced utilization prior to going into One Care um, by over 300 admissions annually and countless emergency room visits. And you know, we did it before we were in this population health model. And I think that that is having some of um, the negative effect that we're feeling uh, in the first two years of participating because there wasn't that excess in, in our base. 
plus our aging population. Uh, so so that, that that's sort of, you know, I just I justify in my mind some of the negative um, performance we've had. Um, doesn't make it right, doesn't make it good, but um, our One Care 19 results shows that uh, we're we're going to be 1.5 million dollars. Uh, we're going to have to pay back, uh, and we're going to owe Medicaid 200 thousand. Um, and the other thing that we do pay in, we pay in about a million five of. Um, dues and we can we can talk about that number but uh, directionally in our expense base is a million five and there are some revenues that offset that um, but um, it, 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 it there is a cost but there's a big learning curve and uh, and again I think we we squeeze some juice out of out of the opportunity prior to joining the program so this slide very busy slide but it just I I I tried to show that um, if we if we run a total fee for service model um, for 2019, for uh, we would have probably had a four percent operating margin. Our audit results were 3.26, and um, the 4.9 is if I extracted and took and made all of our one care, took out the expense, took out the the the, the risk that I'm going to have to pay back. Uh, we probably would have done uh, better than our budget, but um, I th we're in this for the long haul, so um, I'm, I'm just going to move on off of that slide. Um, um, another item that um, uh, in our financial, our operating indicators is that um, we always talk about cash on hand, and you can see, I don't know if you can see on the slide, uh, our cash on hand is always low, but our parent holds our investments, and our cash on hand will be in the 170s. Um, at the end of 2020 and 2021, 172, we're being very, our, our, our finance committee endorsed the fact that uh, we're not going to put a lot of money into or a lot of upside on investment earnings. While we have an investment policy uh, that uh, we follow, uh, we only put in about a 2% uh, gain on our investments. Our investment advisor advised 5%, but this is all non-operating. Uh, and doesn't um, uh, hopefully uh, we hit the five six percent, uh, but for for uh, conservative uh, we we were a little light this year on on our assumption, uh, especially due to the volatility of the market right now. Um, you'll see that our debt service coverage ratio um, will be a little higher this year, um, and in our budget uh, it it will be um, uh, lower. Uh, and that's due to the operating performance. Debt to capitalization ratio um, will be at 25%, but most uh, health systems are in the 35 plus percent. And as Tom mentioned, we're getting old. Um, and uh, and that's what my granddaughter tells me too. So they say, Bampy, you're getting old. So, uh, um, but our physical plan is getting old. Um, next slide I have is the operating expenses, just highlighting it. Um, you know, our expenses are going to go up about 1.4%. About $100 million of our $170 million is, is related to people. Uh, we have salaries and wages of our staff, our benefits, and our providers uh, from the Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, uh, PSA arrangement. All of our providers, 99% of our providers are provided uh, through Dartmouth. Uh, so people cost are about $100 million. Um, in the labor, uh, due to the pandemic, we have not given a, a base uh, salary increase. Uh, however, in this budget for 2021, we will give a base increase earlier in the calendar year than we typically do of 3%. We did add about 13.5 uh, FTEs to the budget um, related to the blueprint. Um, our PHO is, um, is is stopping its existence and they administer the blueprint grant. So we're going to transfer those 13.5 FTEs over from the PHO to the hospital. Um, we also have new functions as Trey talked about. Uh, that's about 11.3 FTEs and probably will go up uh, since we did the budget. Uh, we are scheduling all, all, all outpatients right now in our scheduling department. Uh, the volumes are just uh, too high and uh, um, so we'll probably be adding some FTEs there. 
Uh, and then we did, you know, in our management action plan, we had about 40 FTE, uh, either functions have been eliminated due to re redeployment, changing in staffing models, and, and we're using some national benchmarking tools, um, and as well as uh, attrition and some retirements. Um, in our employee benefits, uh, health benefits are projected to go up 10%. Uh, our, uh, our advisor and our actuary uh, was pushing us um, and um, to, to get it up closer to 15%. We put 10% in the budget. Uh, there may be some risk there, but we think we can manage that and, and we will um, you know, manage that. The, the Dartmouth PSA will be up 2.3%. Um, just a, a footnote, uh, in the narrative, uh, we put 5%. That was a typo, that was an error, uh, but it's 2.3%. Uh, and, uh, and basically went up because we were able to get a neurologist and an endocrinologist that um, uh, have been difficult recruits. Uh, um, and I think Trey would say that all recruiting uh, has been difficult um, uh, for, for providers and uh, hopefully uh, we get some relief uh, there in the future. Supply cost, uh, we put a 5% inflation factor. Cost of drugs will go up about 8%. Uh, we are using the 340B purchasing. Uh, provider tax, there's no, you know, is by definition, and interest will go up a little bit due to the use of our line of credit. Um, I'm gonna to try to get through the next slides in a couple minutes. Uh, the balance sheet uh, we present here, the, the highlight that I would um, go is the middle of the page. We'll be using our line of credit to basically pay off the Medicare advances that we got uh, to keep the cash balance uh, where it needs to be. Um, and, um, you know, other than that, you know, there's not a lot of um, action or movement on the balance sheet that, uh, to discuss. Um, statement of cash flows, as you can see, we do have the increased line of credit at the bottom and the repayment of the advances. Um, when we did the budget, we expected the advances from Medicare to be uh, started to be repaid in August because we received our first advance on August on April 3rd, and they said in 120 days. Uh, however, Medicare has not started to uh, uh, take the money back. I do believe uh, editorial comment that they are negotiating with the hospitals and Congress not to take all that money back the way they were proposing. Um, so this may change. Uh, and the use of our credit line, you know, if, it, if the repayment of the advances gets extended, uh, we may not have to go into the credit line, thus uh, reducing some interest expense. Uh, service line adjustments, so we really didn't have any this year. Um, uh, one one thing that added the anesthesia group, which came aboard uh, January one of 2020, was now in for the full year. Um, and those two difficult recruit, the endocrinologist and the neurologist, are filled. Um, so and they were services that we've been trying to recruit for for years. Uh, and I'll go through the risks and opportunities. They're in the narrative, but uh, the largest risk is what is volume going to do. Um, we, we see, um, we, we prepare a weekly, uh, stat report. We call it our flash report and, um, it's all over the place. One week we're at 105% of where we think we're going to be. The next week we're at 76%. The next week we're at 82, then 94. So volumes, um, are still a wild card. Um, and no consideration for a second shutdown surge or any, any kind of slowdown was included in the budget. Uh, what's the long-term effects of COVID-19? If anybody has the answer, uh, please um, let me know. But uh, there may be greater unemployment, uh, higher Medicaid volumes, higher bad debt. Quality of employment. Will employers be able to provide health insurance? Um, social determinants of health. Uh, we've made a lot of progress here with, with the blueprint and our transitional care. Um, and, you know, as Tom talked about, uh, we got a grant for food. But... During this, um, you know, kids, um, you know, they haven't been going to school. Will they be going to school? Um, so um, we'll have to see how that all shakes out and what's going to happen to commercial volumes. 340B program, um, you know, um, it's about a $5 million positive to us annually. Uh, it's, it's under constant attack, so it's a, it's a risk. Um, population. Um, Getting older, we talked about earlier, this is a slide from last year. Um, 
We beat, uh, going back, uh, Bennington Banner had an article that the over uh, 65 population um, uh, is going up and up, and uh, it was actually more than the strategic plan that we uh, prepared last year. Um, payment rates, um, I'm anxiously waiting for the One Care Vermont. Um, um, you know, in, I'm part of the finance committee on One Care Vermont, and there's a possibility that we could get up to 4.3%, uh, some published um, um, out of the feds, um, but um, uh, still to be determined. But if we can get more than that 1%, that would that will help. That'll help all hospitals. Um, the provider-based billing continues. That's a $4 million impact to, uh, to, to our hospital. Uh, there's a proposal to, to continually um, th th reduce it. So that is not in our budget. That is a risk. Uh, disproportionate share payments is, uh, as you can see, here's our history, um, not going up. Um, bad debt we talked about, but here's all the actual actual numbers. Um, so uh, you'll see some uh, extra pressures on the PL and our team to collect. Uh, we do have some upside items. Uh, we did hire a um, orthopedic surgeon that will uh, is starting either now or in a couple days. Um, and we did not put in any additional um, uh, volumes in there, but we're hoping that he can give us some um, uh, beat what the previous um, provider who left uh, during that 12 month period. So we think we got some upside there. So we may have some vo additional volume. And Tom talked about uh, working with um, um, over St. Peter's, the GI group. Um, so we have an agreement. The GI group will be coming over. We've had a we've had a challenge in GI. We've had a lot of locums. We've brought we've recruited some people. They've left. They come back. Uh, but uh, I'm not proud of it. But uh, we haven't hit our GI procedure uh, targets. Uh, in the past four years, so um, we were conservative. So we have some upside on the contribution margin there from uh, GI that can happen. Uh, other risks are uh, we did not budget for contracted labor in nursing. Uh, we have a new VP of nursing that believes that that's a, a solid assumption. But I just wanted a full disclosure that uh, we do have some risk there. Uh, and she acknowledges that there's risk, but she's willing to manage that. And as I talked about earlier, there's some risk with our employee benefits. Um, inflation, uh, we put in inflation for each expense category, uh, but uh, who knows um, what's going to happen. You know, you hear the word recession, you hear the word inflation, you hear you know, a lot of different words. So there's some risk there. But there's also an opportunity. We're working with um, Dartmouth on some additional 340B group purchasing options, but 340B is a, is a, is a risk as well. So we may have some uh, opportunity there. Uh, the One Care Vermont dues that we um, that we uh, put in the budget were based upon 2020 uh, dues, and um, they are proposing, but it's not approved yet by either the Finance Committee or the Board of Trustees of One Care to reduce our dues uh, down. So this may be an opportunity for us uh, there. Uh, regulatory rate increases, retention of providers, volumes, pay a mix, political climate all our um, other risks, I can go on, um, but I'll, I'll move on to capital and I'll wrap up with uh, our planned spend is about 5.7 million. Uh, we put a hold on our um, capital budget this year uh, and we are about to uh, open it back up, um, but we will take our 2020 capital budget, which we put a hold on, uh, during the pandemic, and we will spend that money between now and January, which which bleeds into the FY21 uh, fiscal year, and then we will probably do about $3.7 million of replacement capital. Uh, we don't have any specific projects now. We'll be doing an evaluation, but the cash flows will be about 5.7 on capital. Um, as you know, we have the emergency room and main entrance project. Um, when you get ready to go into a $25 million project for a hospital our size, you got to squeeze your capital as you, um, your capital spend uh, in the in the years before. Um, so we have that uh, CON in. We're working with Donna Jerry and team uh, on questions and. Uh, uh, hope to have that all resolved uh, shortly. 
And then we will be looking at our cancer center, which um, the proposed cost about nine months ago could be as much as $10 million, but we got to get through the ED and main entrance projects. So those would be the um, major items uh, coming down the road. So I will take a breath and stop and unshare my, uh, I hope I do this right. Um, okay. Um, so thank you, and hope I didn't go too fast, but uh, um, we're here for questions. You definitely, you definitely went, fast, went fast, but I think we got it all. <laughs> so, so we're going to start our questioning with our Bennington native on the board, Member Pelham. Tom? Well, thank you. Um, I was flipping pages fast here, and uh, uh, the, too fast probably, but that's okay. I mean, I, I look at the step back and look at the big picture and it's, uh, you know, you, you've had, you know, five years of decent, you know, operating margins and uh, your rate increases, charge increases haven't been that great, 2.8% to 3.4%. To and, uh, but I, you know, have every faith that you will weather this with all the risks that, you know, that, that, that you've laid out. I just have some, you know, small questions, basically. Um, you know, I, I there was you know one point where you're you're looking at a, a deduct of five hundred thousand dollars in Medicaid having to do with the aging population of Bennington County moving mm -hmm. from commercial to uh, uh, to Medicare. And I'm just wondering if there's any reverse of that from people who move from Medicaid to Medicare. Uh, um, is there a positive, some maybe minor positive offsetting revenue side to that dynamic? So, so if a y yes, there is, Tom. Um, if if they go from Medicaid to Medicare, there's there's a small increase in our reimbursement. Um, the focus um, in our budget presentation and what we really focus on is the shift from commercial, when a person is is under 65, working, having the Blue Cross card uh, or Cigna card, to Medicare. That's the big gap, and that's really what that five hundred and fifty thousand dollars is. Um, uh, you know, it, it it going from Medicaid to Medicare or, or vice versa, it, it doesn't move that much, but there's a big gap when you go from commercial yeah. to Medicare. No, that, that that makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, just looking at the, uh, uh, I went back and looked at your twenty twenty budget, and I actually word searched it for the word travelers. Um, and locum, and I found it. I found locum once having to do with physicians. So, but you you mentioned travelers uh, in your presentation a little bit today, and I'm 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 just wondering, you know, where you stand with travelers. Uh, what well, maybe maybe what the last few months have been, where you stood with travelers uh, at Southern Vermont, uh, what happened during the COVID intensity, and then as you're coming out and heading toward 2021. You know, what do you see in that regard? Um, also kind of think, thinking about Southern Vermont College, that you were on a path to, you know, develop some uh, uh, employee uh, um, you know, recruitments uh, in that, in that you know, in, at that institution, which is now off the table given its closure. So just thinking about travelers and uh, labor force here. So um, in, you, you noticed um, there's, in one of our risks, we put in um, that there is no travelers on the nursing side uh, budgeted in our budget. So we have a risk there, okay? Our new chief nursing officer uh, is quite confident she can achieve what she, what she needs to um, um, not having travelers. Um, and we, while Southern Vermont College closed, we are working closely with Castleton. And I think Tom mentioned that. Yeah early uh, in, in, his, in the presentation. The hey, word hey, locum. Hey, hey, Steve, just, on, just two points, Tom. One is that the, our, our CNO has been able to eliminate all travelers since she's been here. And she's, you know, she's been here now six months. So we think the assumption is a pretty good assumption she'll be able to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the Castleton relationship um, is continuing to grow. So uh, we're optimistic that um, it's going to be a, a successful program for the recruitment of nurses, and hopefully, we'll keep that those traveler numbers um, off the books. 
So where were you on Traveler's numbers um, before you didn't have any? We were we were very low. We were less than half a million dollars a year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just uh, curious as to kind of what you see, given that you're Southern Vermont, in terms of um, uh, maybe talent and uh, you know the, the the kind of real estate market or health healthcare market. Are there people that you're seeing are looking to get out of uh, New Jersey, New York, and places like that, and and head to Vermont? You know, I think, you know, Tom, I think like a lot of places in Vermont, we're seeing an uptick right now. It's, it's the first up, uptick I've seen in my in my 12 years. And um, certain areas like the North, the Northshire region, Manchester, Dorset, uh, it's a very hot market there. But even in Bennington, we're seeing um, we're seeing movements there. So, you know, we're guardedly optimistic that that may stay on for a while. Um but I can't say it's a it's going to be definite for um, you know a long period of time. But right now we're feeling a slight uptick, and we're actually seeing the first increase in the real estate market in ten years. And, wow. and we did we did not, Tom. We did not um, make any assumptions on that in our budget because it's just too early. Maybe Tom, next year. Maybe next year. That's something we can we will consider. Well, I still own some land in Arlington, if you know anyone that's interested. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at your uptick in the Medicaid in your uh, Medicaid line item of $106,000. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering how close is that increase to covering a projected increase in, in services uh, uh, to Medicaid folks um, in, in 2020? 2021. So you're you're projecting $106,000 income on your on your Medicaid NPR, um, but obviously that's not going to you know cover you know the full increase in costs. Do you have any sense of how much is being left on the table or being shifted somewhere else? Yeah, Medicaid's been. I'm looking at Jim Roy, my controller, because um, the $106,000 number doesn't resonate. Uh, it, it, Jim reports that um, our Medicaid volume has been pretty flat um, for the past couple of years. So, in our 12 month run rate um, analysis, uh, we saw it flat, so we left it flat. We put no rate increase in. So, it's okay. pretty much the same. But a risk to us is. If the economy doesn't come back, if more people get on the Medicaid rolls and that number goes up, we're going to be challenged. Right. Um, and finally, just let's just to hypothetically assume that somehow the state increases its 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 rates in Medicaid, and uh, your Medicaid number comes in uh, with an additional million or so um, in revenue. What what would you do with that in terms of investing it in an expense line or letting it fall to the bottom line uh, to help help your operating margin? Well, we would have to look at uh, where that million dollars coming from. But right now, today, with a break even um, uh, break even bottom line, uh, I would say we should uh, responsibly put it on the bottom line, um, okay. and especially with our capital project upcoming. Okay. Well, thank you. That's all I have. And, uh, you know, take care of that room I was born in that you showed me when I was down there last time. <laughs> before I uh, before I turn it over to Maureen, who is the new chief chief nursing officer there? Her name is Pamela Duchesne. And um, you know, Pam came to us from Massachusetts and has been there for um, she started in, in January, right before the COVID hit. And she's um She's terrific. Very, Great. Very, very fortunate. Good to hear. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to member Yusufer. Maureen? Uh, thanks. Um, first, thank you for the very detailed presentation. Um, you know, typically you guys hit your top and bottom line numbers uh, compared to your budget. So, Steve, I'm sure this is driving you crazy. <laughs> that uh, There's a lot of uh, variability uh, going into the forecast. Um, I just have a couple questions. So in your commentary, you talked about um, some FTEs, 11.3 FTEs for new COVID function. And I know you've redeployed some people and things like that. But um, 
Did you think about when you looked at your commercial rate increase, putting any of those people related to the COVID into a COVID only increase, hoping that they will go away um, over time in another year or so? You know what? Um, I, and, and Trey may kill me for this, but I think this is the new norm. So um, I think we're going to uh, have to, yeah, yeah, Trey just hit his head, but um, that's the way we built it. And Maureen, be frank, uh, I, th I think we're going to be living with this um, for a while. And um, we're actually probably going to be adding to that, to those, to that FTE count um, based upon some recent things that, that we're looking to do. So uh, related to COVID. So no, I did not. And maybe they'll go away. Maybe maybe everything Steve, will get back to normal. Steve, wouldn't you say really that those are, I mean, again, in my mind, they're not really new FTEs in the system. We're redeploying existing people, personnel. So, so in my presentation, uh, we, we eliminated 40 positions, of which 11 of those, 11 of those um, got redeployed. So it was a net 29. We got rid can, of you, um, can you just go over, because I, I, I thought I saw some conflicting information in one of the backup schedules about what you received for COVID that you need to pay back and what you received that you don't need to pay back. There was a chart in there that, you, that was filled out for our submission that said there was nothing that you received that um, you wouldn't have to pay back. And then there was another comment in your commentary. I think you got about $9 million. So just trying to get a handle on, you know, what did you receive so far before um, the new grant? So um, we received in Medicare advances $9,470,000. That has to be paid back to Medicare. Yeah. We, we uh, also received an advance from Blue Cross of approximately $1.9 million that has to be paid back to Blue Cross. We also received in stimulus um, money uh, from HHS, total of $9.7 million that, that today does not need to be repaid um, because we meet uh, all the requirements to keep that money according to uh, HHS. We also received uh, $784,000 worth of, uh, I call it Medicaid COVID-19 retainer money. And approximately 10% of that may, may, the operative word is may, need to be repaid. So I know Lori asked us, she said there was some conflicting uh, data. And when we looked at the when we looked at the table, Jim is handing me the table, it said um, budget fiscal year 2021 um, funding sources. Uh, we left that blank. Uh, and then um, we showed the repayment and the $78,000, which is 10% of the $784,000. Uh, may may need to repay be repaid, and we as we're making the assumption it will be repaid, um, but it may not be repaid. Okay, and I no. think maybe this chart was it. The chart I was looking at, right, was it says budget fiscal year twenty one, but then I talked about the funding sources in fiscal year twenty, and how much was um, to be paid wasn't to be paid back and i think that was related to 20. everyone else yeah. kind of interpreted that as 20 and so yeah. that's why i was getting confused on that chart. yeah we okay we we after Lori asked us the question uh we didn't um go back and change it because we said it said budget year 2021 so okay that's okay and then you talked about i think for the grant you were potentially put in for another 12 to 15 million of lost revenue wouldn't most likely the roughly 10 million that re you receive from HHS be That's adjusted right. for that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you might get another couple million, two, three right. million dollars or so if all worked out. Right. Well. So the, st the stabilization grant that we submitted with the state does not ask you for an amount. They ask you for yeah. data and they, we gave them all the data. Plus they asked us, what have you gotten from Medicare? What have you gotten from HHS? What have you gotten? And then the, they're going to, you know, they have a methodology that they're going to use. Okay, no, that's okay. I just wanted to make it, it's not going to be 12 to 15 million. No. It's going to be net of whatever. So, 
Um, and then you you typically talk a little bit about um, you know your regional area and how you get an you know inflow outflow of people from you know Massachusetts, New York, things like that. And obviously with COVID, it's probably been impacted greatly from that. And just you know, do you, are you seeing big changes there or? So the reason it, we didn't, um, and you're right, every year I talk about it a little bit, um, we've plateaued, okay? So we're not seeing an increase. Like over the past couple okay. of years, we saw an increase. Um, and we've pretty much plateaued on our revenue from New York. We've plateaued on our revenue from um, Massachusetts. Um, so uh, that's why it was not a you know point of interest. Uh, we do believe, uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to um, improve that with some initiatives that we're, we're looking for uh, in the, the next fiscal year, probably be able to do, but they won't be implemented and won't get up and running until late in the fiscal year, so we didn't put them in the budget. Okay. And then typically, you've always targeted about a 3.5% operating margin and talked about the fact of your age of plant and that, you know, you needed to make sure you had enough cash once you started investing, which obviously, you know, the um, emergency room and things like that will be the start of that. And this year, you're not looking for that. And is really your ability to, to do that partly because of where your cash flow, days cash on hand, is netting out? Because it looks to be, it looks to be for the end of the year, and where you think it's going to be about 170 days, which would still be healthy. Right. So, the um, the ED project um, uh, will be funded um, significantly through fundraising, as well yeah. as our cash reserves, and we are uh, also will be incurring some debt related to that. So, um, and I, I was referring more to the fact that you usually always go for three and a half percent. Yeah. every year and part of that justification has been because of the age of plant and things like that and obviously for 20 you're not looking for that large of an operating margin which I, I think you're reflecting you know a reasonable request but um, are you doing that partially because of where your cash flow is projected to be ending out for 21 so the 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 current budget we're asking for um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but is based upon our volume assumptions, which we're hoping yeah. that we're going to do better, um, and and what our expense base is, and taking some expenses out based upon our performance improvement plan that we were putting in place. So, um, would I like a three and a half percent operating margin? Absolutely, it would it would make um, things a lot easier. But when we put all the pieces together. Um, it, it just didn't work out this year, and we can't. We we can't. I don't want to put a three three and a half percent operating margin and not hit it um, yeah, yeah. because of our volume. Because volume is a significant driver in this budget. Okay, and as you saw, we if you go and you and you, our volumes were trending down. Okay, and. I like to say some of that volume trending down was due to all the successes we had in one care, um, but that wasn't the case in one care because we we were negative. Um, right, you were so, down four percent. You said right. Yeah. So so we 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 built off of that foundation, um, looked at our expenses really closely, reduced where we could, but we had to build up in order to address the pandemic. So um, ideally, you know, and and. In our discussions, I would love, you know, 3% is kind of like where I want to be, but it, it just didn't work this year. You know, Maureen, okay. just to add to what Steve says, um, our board has approved this budget. Um, they, they weren't enamored with it, to be honest. And they're also pushing managements, and we're pushing ourselves to do better than this. Um, but given all the assumptions on the on the volume side, the unknowns, we said we, we got to get through the rest of this this calendar year to see how this is playing out. So, um, but we will work hard to beat this budget. Okay. All right, good, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Maureen. Next is uh, Member Holmes, Jessica. Great, okay, thank you so much. Um, 
And I, I do want to extend a huge thank you to all of you. I think yeah, obviously it's clear from um, Dr. Dobson's presentation, the Herculean effort that you all undertook to uh, make sure that the hospital was prepared for this pandemic and protect your frontline workers in the community. So I really I'm genuine in my thanks for that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, this this budget, as you just said, um, Steve, is just based on, on volume. And so I'm kind of, I really am trying to dig into understand this from each hospital's perspective. Um, so your volumes were down about 4% before the COVID hit. And I haven't really understood why what the root cause of that is, is, particularly with the aging of your population, I would think your volumes, frankly, would be up just because as people obviously get older, they, you know, utilize the services more. So is it population decline? Is it, I mean, what, if you have any guesses, I could see some of the specialties that you presented that were down and I'm trying to do some detective work, but what have you all discovered about the, pop the uh, volume declines? You know, you, Steve, you, I was gonna say even before Steve answers, <clears throat> it's part of it is the calendarization of this, Jessica. We mm -hmm. normally have, a. we always miss our budget projections the first quarter of the year. I mean, uh, I've been okay. there 11 or 12 years, every year we've missed it. And you know, as part of it is the time of year. It's the holidays, so it's not unusual for us to be off our 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 projections. You know, definitely the first quarter and into the second quarter. So I think that's part of part of the issue is that. Um, but you know, we, we've also been kind of kind of scratching our head as to you know what else could have been impacted there. Um, and Trey may have some better thoughts right now, and just in terms of some of the specialties, but. Um, don't lose sight of for us is that uh, the timing of the calendar has always impacts us. Yeah, and, and to add to what Tom says, yes, we usually come out of the box really slow. But last summer, which the, the, the period May through August is usually strong for us, was, was volume-wise, we were way behind. So... If you combine, you know, what Tom said, uh, coming out of the box first quarter, then you add that that four months where we're really strong, okay? And is that going to reoccur or not reoccur, okay? Well, when we prepared the budget, it wasn't reoccurring because we're coming out of the, the pandemic. So uh, I wasn't about, you know, one year's not a trend, but one year can be a trend. Uh, we also um, have seen a population decline. We've also seen a flattening, as Maureen asked the question, a flattening of the uptick that we had seen each year in New York volume and in Massachusetts volume. So that is flattened out. Okay, um, insurance barriers in those two markets are still challenging. Okay, um, and um, so and then as I said, our endo program, we haven't hit our numbers in four years. So we're, I squeezed those down this year. Yeah, we have a new program starting with um, um, a GI group from uh, Albany, but you know what? I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be wrong five years in a row. Um, <laughs> you don't like to be wrong. I know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and so I, I think it's a combination of everything. And as Tom said, our board has challenged us, but. They, they also challenged, the finance committee challenged me on our volume assumptions because that has been our Achilles heel um, over the past couple of years. We've, we've met the payer mix assumptions. We've met the out of state assumptions. We've met uh, our, we've managed our expenses really well uh, over the years, but our volume has always been the, I'll say the softest of our, um, of our assumptions. So, um, so this year we took the, the, the 12 month, remember we, in that 12 months, we had a weak summer and, you know, is that coming back? And, you know, this summer, I don't think it's fair to, to use, but it's been up and down. Yeah. And so there's no adjustment there for the impact of social distancing, disinfectant, patient fear, just a COVID effect on volumes for next year. Well, there's, there's in our scheduling, OK, uh, we have rolled back a little bit in radiology and and uh, other departments a little bit uh, because we can't have everybody showing up and just crank, crank, crank. Right. Um, 
So there's a little bit, not that much. It's more okay. of our, it was more of our 12 month trend. Okay. Just Jessica, can, can you guys hear me? Am I coming through? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I had to switch off into my desktop. So now you see more of my office than me, but um, let me just answer two things. I'll go backwards. Um, the fear of uh, that patients have for coming in um, I have to just give a lot of credit to our staff. We've been out in the community. We've been talking with people, um, and we really went out uh, hard and fast, and we've shown them the safety. So our volumes walking back through the system, um, are, you know, are, are very strong in that regard, comparison. Um, of course, we're using the telemedicine. We're using all the things that we need to do to, to keep people safe. Uh, that was a big fear of all of ours, and including mine. Uh, and it seems like we've, we've probably overcome that we still have some risk, and that is uh, community outbreaks and clusters will again cause people. But the second thing, let me let me just give another perspective on our volume. So over the past 12 to 24 months, our primary care practices have been capped. In other words, we've had people leave, retire, uh, and and the actual volume in the primary care offices has flattened or decreased, and new patients can't get in. And so when we have new people move into the community, they can't get into a local primary, so they go to primary elsewhere. And when they go to those primaries elsewhere, they get referred for their inguinal hernia uh, elsewhere. They get referred for their mammogram elsewhere. So actually, we only had two of our six primary care offices accepting new patients this year, which is actually a, a wrong direction that we need to be. And I think that actually uh, really dovetails with referrals into uh, into our specialties, you know, appropriate referrals. I'm not talking about unnecessary referrals. I'm talking about appropriate referrals. You know, anecdotally in the community, patients are moving in. They can't get a primary, so they go to Pittsfield or Albany for their primary. That's where they get referred into for specialties. Fortunately, uh, we've, we've recruited in two this year that are both open and seeing patients, and, and we plan to have some more in the fall. More uh, hires. You're hiring even more in the fall, primary care? Primary care, that's right, yeah. Okay. Um, that's terrific news. We all agree that primary care is essential. So, um, so uh, the second question, you, uh, I'm trying to get a handle on how hospitals view medical inflation. And thankfully, your presentation and your narrative gave me a lot of information um, about how you're viewing sort of the healthcare inflationary costs going forward. So let me just make sure that I understand um, this. So the compensation, the expectation is a 3% increase generally in, in wages and salaries. There was no increase this year, you're rolling it over into next year. So 3% in that bucket. Supplies, the, ex, the, the price effect there is about a 5% assumption, right? And then pharmaceuticals was 8%? Correct. Can you just, uh, so compensation was about 60%, right, of your overall expenses. What is the percentage of supplies and then also farm? Just so I can kind of get a, I'm looking for like a weighted average. So, Pharmacy, uh, pharmacy, pharmacy, pharmacy is about fourteen million dollars, Jim. So eight percent on eight percent on fourteen million is what about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So fourteen million represents uh, what seven percent of our budget. Okay. Okay. Um, and then salaries, like you said, sixty per. You know, people cost is about sixty uh, percent. Uh, and the supply costs are roughly 10 or 11 million dollars, and that represents what six or seven percent of our budget. Um, so if you do a weighted, if you do a weighted average, um, you're probably three, probably, I, I would say it would be circling around. And I'm doing this off of my head, Jessica. So don't I see you got no you're looking down, you may got to calculate. <laughs> Maybe no, about no, overall five percent um, cost increase, but in there also keep in mind we have some cost savings initiatives that uh, that that we're doing. No, I know, and I'm just I'm trying to get a sense of there's no general agreement on medical inflation it seems, yeah. and so I'm just trying to get a sense of you know there's large buckets, there's compensation, there's supplies, you know, and then there's pharmacy, right, and then there's some other stuff. So I'm just trying to get a sense of overall how do those um, what is the growth assumptions on each of the, in each of those buckets, and how big are those buckets? That's so you yeah, answer. so if I could just comment on um, you know. Yeah. We try, you know, we work every angle. 
Um, if you read the periodicals, I should be telling you that medical inflation should be anywhere between six to eight to nine, maybe 10 percent. Um, and um, we don't, we, that's not in our budget because we're going to find ways of reducing, you know, the use of things, change things. Um, but, you know, I, I know uh, many of my colleagues in Vermont, we have discussions at DeVos meet, CFO meetings that that when you ask for a three three point four six percent increase in your in your rates, that doesn't cover inflation, and that is a true that is a true statement. So we need to be innovative. We need to figure out ways of delivering care more uh, effectively, efficiently, and um, and you know that's where population health comes in. That and 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 we it's it's. Altogether, we got to figure a way to bend that cost curve down and and provide the high quality care. And as Tom mentioned, you know we're uh, we got recognized as you know a, a real good value. Um, and the definition of value is different amongst all of us. But um, you looking at all the metrics, so um, you know we we. Maybe this is a paid to advertise announcement. We, we try really hard. <laughs> no, I do. And I actually looked at that Institute report, and you guys were like an A+. Plus. I mean, I actually looked it up, right? Wasn't Didn't they give you an A or an A+. Plus? A plus, just yeah. professor, I know that's pretty hard. I don't give A-pluses. So there you go. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, actually, I just if I recall, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but is it true, is this my recollection true that last year you had paid a pinnacle $500,000 to, to basically to find some cost savings in your system. These are my scribble notes from last year. Does this ringing any bells? Yeah, yeah, we, I'm not. How that um, turned out? Because I know. I think the $500,000 was a combination of strategic plan and cost savings. Okay. And part of um, some of the initiatives that we were putting in the February plan before the pandemic hit, which are built in, um, came from the Pinnacle um, um, project. Okay. So staffing that, changes and things like that. Is that staffing excuse, changes? Yes, some of the staffing changes. Um, we're all, as well as we're using an outside tool for the staffing uh, uh, changes. Um, some process redesign. Um, some uh, they've looked at our comp model uh, yeah. for our for our providers uh, and given us some uh, information on how we could become more. Um, I'll just say efficient. Um, and, um, you know, so they, they gave us some good ideas. Uh, some of them we've implemented, some of them we're still in the process of implementing, uh, but they're all built into the budget. Any estimate of how much cost savings were generated from that? From them, I'm going to say, you know, let's call it a million dollars. And then there's another million from another, yeah. you know, uh, project yeah. and, you know. So well worth the expense. And, and Jessica, like we haven't. <laughs> We haven't yet implemented. Uh, we're not looking to do the comp changes until until January of next year. So that's that's not a small piece. Okay, just you know, I remember it from the last budget, and I was looking forward to hearing the results of it. So that's you know, I wanted to follow up on that. Um, and my last question is, if you had to carve out the COVID-related expenses that are built into the 2021 budget, whether that's you know, uh, FTEs or screeners or PPE that has to be purchased. Is, have you carved that out at all in any of your grant applications? And do you have a dollar value on that? So um, in the budget, we have, you know, it's called 12 FTEs. So that's about $750,000 with benefits. Um, and we probably have another uh, three, $400,000 worth of additional supply costs for PPE. Okay. In incremental increase. That's right. just not that's that's not for PPE period, but that's right. the incremental cost increase. Right. Um, and if we had no COVID, you wouldn't have to spend it. Yeah. Got it. Um, okay. Are there any other expenses that you can think of? Testing expenses or any other things that well, would there, be in that bucket? Yeah. Our, you know, the interesting uh, thing was um, yesterday I was talking to our lab director and, um, you know, we talking, you know, I was my monthly meeting with her going over her budget and I'm like, how come, how come you're not over budget? Because we did not budget for all this COVID testing. 
Okay. And all the, you know, cause we send it out to UVM, we send tests out, we do some tests here, but, uh, and she told me that some of the high price testing that we typically do weren't getting done at the same volume as they were pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. So she says it's basically washed in her budget. Um, so she wasn't incurring those costs, but now she's incurring this cost. So now she's on budget. And I, I asked her, I said, what happens when things get back to normal and we're continuing to do COVID testing? Right. She goes, you're probably going to fire me because I'm going to be over budget. And I said, no, I'm not going to fire you, but, um, but we, we will have to keep an eye on that. And one of the, one of the, the tests that um, uh, we haven't done a lot of uh, is tick testing. For some reason, during this pandemic period, um, we haven't had a lot of demand for um, the tick, the high cost tick testing. We're still doing some, but not as much as we, we in, in the past. That's shocking because the hiking trails are overrun by people. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't, you know, we just don't have the same expense load as we had a, a year ago when she built her budget. But we have the COVID testing costs all the reagents and all that thing. So, so it's washing out. So it's, it's kind of like being disguised a little bit. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Those are my questions. Thank you, Jess. Um, next is member Lund, Robin. Hi, sorry. It took me a moment to get off mute. I only have a couple questions that other folks haven't asked. It's that's the benefit of going towards the end, I guess. Um, I was curious when you were talking about um, your one care results, if you had any sense of what was driving the difference um, from the benchmark. Um, the, basically, volume outside of one care. Okay. okay. Uh, patients going either to uh, Albany. Uh, we have, a, uh, looking at the data that we're allowed to look at, we had a lot of patients going to Albany um, for high-end procedures, things that we don't do. Um, so it's outside a network, and we also had um, uh, uh, several cases go down to New York City, um, and when you look at where they went, you know they were serious cases, mm -hmm. um, as well as just greater volume. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I was curious how the changes in the Medicare sequestration impact you, if at all. So me Medicare sequestration was uh, reversed through the end of this fiscal through the end of this calendar year. So that would be about that would be probably about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars off off of my head. Um, Great. Um, I think that's it. All my other questions were answered either in your presentation or by someone else asking them. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. At this time, I'm going to turn over the questioning to the Healthcare Authority. Mike Fisher. Healthcare Authority. Advocate, but you're also <laughs> such an authoritarian figure, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I think about that. Um, thank you. Uh, just a few quick questions. First one, um, I think is probably for Dr. Dobson. Um, um, this morning we heard from a different hospital um, about reductions in um, uh, emergency department during COVID for conditions like stroke and heart condition and, you know, let alone um, chronic conditions. Um, I don't know whether you experienced that, um, but I didn't ask the question earlier, and I'd be curious of your perspective. This is obviously a national, we heard this story nationally as well. But here we are four, five months later. One would think we would have seen that play out on a human level, on a medical level. And I, I just wondered if you had a perspective on that category of deferred care. Sure. Um, so, Mike, it's the, the problem we're hampered with in trying to analyze this is volume. You know, volumes in, in our centers in Vermont are so low that um, changes could be due to chance or changes could be due to reality. So we have to look towards larger systems. And I believe that's what you were referring to when you look at the data out of uh, New York, New Jersey, um, and then other places in the country with uh, cardiac arrest deaths 
nearly 1.5 times as many, which is was actually a, a remarkable amount in the short amount of time. So any anecdotal stuff of observations here or just anecdotal, um, we are uh, fortunate that our ED volume, which dropped down to about 50%, uh, has come back up significantly. And I say fortunate uh, for the community, you know, having the people getting the care they need, not, not unnecessary yeah. care. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, maybe, maybe Steve, um, I was uh, interested to hear about um, a reduction in your one care dues. Um, and I, I guess I, I gather that you don't know exactly where that will land yet, but I'd be curious to hear you uh, uh, hear what you think about the affordability of those dues at this time, given all the pressures on your hospital. Well, all the aff affordability, uh, it's a cost. Uh, yeah, we do get some revenues back, but um, any place where, um, you know, I, I sometimes look at those dues, what, what I was going to say is any place where we can cut costs um, helps. Um, and I look at those dues sometimes um, um, in, in, with my lens as saying I'm paying to be in a risk program, right. which I have downside risk and I have upside opportunity. But we tend to focus always on the downside risk, which I do because I'm a CFO, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a pessimist, um, in that I'm paying to be part of a, a program that all I can do is really lose money on. And that's a bad way to look at it because uh, ultimately population health, uh, and if we, can, if we can really master this, and it will take time, um, is a good thing for Bennington, Vermont in the country. Um, so an investment, but an investment of $1.5 million from my hospital, I think is too much. Okay. Um, I also, in the same area, um, I was interested to read uh, in your narrative, the uh, your philosophy and your strategy around accounting for risk. Um, I think it's a different philosophy than many other Vermont hospitals, not accounting for upside or downside risk. And I, I, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on it and how you've landed with that perspective. So, so basically my perspective is pick the midpoint when you do your budget, okay? Um, and, 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 and that's where I land. And then if the results come in worse, okay, you recognize it. If the results come in better, you recognize it. But during the year, when I don't have all the data, I like to be conservative. So when the final result comes in, either I'm there or I do better. But for a budget, I, I, I and you're right, I do differ th from some of my colleagues in, in Vermont. I think you got to pick the midpoint. Uh, for a budget, because if I picked the low end, I'm going to be asking for a higher rate request. Right. Okay. If I pick the high end, I'm going to probably ask. Well, I won't ask for a lower rate request, but you know, the, and the high end is is probably not realistic. Mm -hmm. So picking the midpoint is, I think it's the safe way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think it's 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 right in the middle, and. Um, um, you know, that's, you yeah. know, we're in a crystal ball and, and I don't have enough history um, to be able to say wh where, wh what's right and what's wrong at this point. We're still, this is still, we're in our infancy of, of working through this. Uh, from a consumer advocate's perspective, I appreciate um, picking the midpoint rather than picking the low point. Right. Um, lastly, can you just tell me a little bit of what's going on with Blueprint? Um, I, I, do I see it as a positive and a negative, and what drives this so, 1.4? Yeah, so um, our PHO, our physician hospital organization, is um, it has run its life cycle, and and the blueprint has been administered through the PHO. the The contract with blueprint is being transferred over to the hospital. Okay, so what will happen is now the hospital will get the revenue, but the hospital will also incur the expense for a net zero. That's right. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a 
plus revenue and in other operating revenue, not net patient service revenue. And then we have salary expense, we have benefits, and we have other expenses. And it, and it should be a, it, in the budget, it's a net zero. But it adds to our, our, our cost base. So we're going to be the administrating agent of the blueprint monies. Very good. Thank you much. Thank you, Mike. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the SVMC budget. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer a comment? I have a comment. Go ahead, Dale. Um, I actually have two. Um, one is in relation to schools. Um, I have not heard yet. I'm sorry, Dale. I'm sorry. In relation to what? I missed the word. Schools. Schools. Thank you. Um, I've been following that as an issue too, schools reopening. And I'm concerned I'm not really seeing a connection between hospitals being prepared for what could happen when schools reopen. I know the guidance comes from the health department, but I'm I'm a bit puzzled as far as I don't see any articles telling me how hospitals are prepared for what could happen within communities as schools reopen. I was just wondering if their hospital has any thoughts on that. And the second one quickly would be, in your emergency department, are you seeing people show up needing the emergency department because they can't get to see their primary care physician? Um, are you seeing, it may not be an increase in utilization, but are you seeing a different kind of utilization taking place? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Trey, do you want to take those? Sure. So, Dale, on the first one, um, with the school system, uh, yeah, we absolutely um, recognize that there will be increased need when schools start, and that's because people are closer together and the virus is spread. Uh, we know that's the case. In fact, we, we talk about that as when it will occur, not if it will occur. Uh, we also know most of that um, demand will be through testing and not hospitalization. <laughs> Um, as well as um, office visits. And that's why we set up that, that thing I referred to called the Respiratory Evaluation Center. That's also for kids. We actually have uh, the pediatricians also staffing that unit there. Um, so we, we do anticipate, in fact, we do our own internal modeling uh, that predicts an, you know, an increase in the area with, um, with schools starting up. Um, and in regards to your your second question, remind me again what that was. That's just the subject, and I'll answer it. Your emergency room department, okay. not that it was necessarily an increase in utilization, but a change in how the utilization was occurring because there's people coming in because they can't get to see their primary care physician on so time or at all. Yeah, so we've gotten pretty pretty lucky in that regard and also done a lot of work. It's a great question, Dale. It's hard to tease out. During the height of the fear and anxiety with the preparation of surge, even though our volume dropped by 50%, our acuity uh, was quite high. Um, but since that time, uh, in, I'm talking about in our emergency department, since that time, the implementation of the telemedicine and again, this, this separate respiratory evaluation center it, it really has allowed people to get in to see their primary. Um, a lot of telephone conversations to help people through uh, the situation, uh, the use of the telemedicine, and then they get steered towards the respiratory evaluation center. You actually bring up a really good point, and that is uh, as a part of the emergency declaration, we're actually able to help people uh, not go to the emergency department but instead go to a, a lesser um, acute area if that's what is uh, needed, and so we've been able to do that and sort of keep them in the um, in the most appropriate place. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I know that we have uh, one announcement to make. Before we get to that, I just want to uh, thank the. The team from Bennington, uh, Tom, Trey, and Steve, uh, very thorough presentation, uh, much appreciated. Um, we'll let you get back to actually running the hospital. And Susan, if you could uh, make the, the required announcement. Sure. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, last week, the board issued its decisions on the uh, qualified health plans for uh, 2021. Um, the board completed its review of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Healthcare's requested rate increases for small group and individual plans, as I said, on um, Vermont Health Connect for 2021. Based on the submitted filings, there are approximately 39,000 Blue Cross Blue Shield members and 37,000 MVP members enrolled in the plans affected by these filings. Blue Cross Blue Shield initially requested a 6.4% average annual rate increase over 2020 premiums. After hearing recommendations from the board's actuaries and following the submissions of hospitals' FY 2020 budgets, Blue Cross Blue Shield increased its requested rate to 6.7%. MVP initially requested a 7.3 average annual rate increase over 2020 premiums. After hearing recommendations from the board's actuaries and following the submission of hospitals' FY 2021 budgets, MVP de decreased its requested rate to 6.4%. As I said on Friday of last week, August 14th, the board issued its decisions for these filings. The board reduced Blue Cross Blue Shield's rate increase from 6.7% to 4.2%, okay. and MVP's rate increase from 6.4% to 2.7%. The board's decisions for these filings may be viewed on the board's rate review web pages. And I probably should have started off this announcement by saying, per statute, we must announce decisions made um, for rates uh, after that decision is made at our next public hearing or public meeting, which for this particular rate decision was this hearing. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Um, Kim, everything seemed to work smoothly. Um, are you back with us on Thursday? I am not. I forget if it's Sonny or Joanne who will be here Thursday. Okay. okay. I'm amazed that you were able to uh, uh, make out some of the uh, testimony um, when uh, it was got a little bit garbled, but you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. With that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. In the middle of this hearing, we got a tremendous downpour here, and now the sun is back out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. We appreciate thank your you. attention. Thank Bye, you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.